All right. Perfect. Okay, question number eight says, why do metals tend to form cations? In other words, why does a metal want to form a positive ion? If anybody in class at any point in time wants to answer any of the questions, please feel free to either speak up or raise your hand. And we can reward you with a Jolly Rancher if you want. Yep, yep, yep. There goes the, oops. But nobody's speaking up yet on question number eight. And I want to keep this thing moving. Metals tend to form cations because they have anywhere from one to three valence electrons. In other words, when we put that stair step line down right here, anything on this side of the periodic table is a metal. And that means that in their valence shell, they either have one, two, or three electrons in their, in their outermost or valence shell. The transition metals tend to be one or two electrons and we know that because we see a lot of plus one and plus two charges occasionally we also see also see a plus three charge i mean really there's other ones too but those are the common ones so for metals with only a couple electrons it's easier to lose them rather than try to have to gain a whole lot remember we're trying to hit eight electrons in our outermost energy level so if you only have one to three it's hard to gain five six or seven the amount of energy required for that is just too difficult. In question number nine, they want us to write the electron configuration of the silver ion. So we're going to begin by writing the configuration of just silver as it is. This is how I want you to do it on your test. On your test, I probably will write question number nine a little bit differently. And it will say, please write the electron configuration of silver, then write the electron configuration of silver with a plus one charge. And so what I want to see, because I know that you're going to be able to go to the internet and Google search these, that you find the silver on your periodic table, that you tell me that its location is 4d9, and that when you count all of the electrons by saying 4d9, you're talking about all of these positions that are actually filled by different elements, but they're really positions 49, 48, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then we keep going backward and we hit the 5s2 and the 5s1 that are held in the positions by the elements strontium and rubidium. Then we cha-ching with our typewriter to an inner energy level four, which is the same configuration as what Krypton has. And so instead of writing out all the rest of the configuration, we just stop right there. Um, so then what you have to do is figure out what does the silver ion want to do? And I would accept one of two answers. Actually, I would probably accept one of three answers. One of those answers could be that you decide to take away an electron from the 4D9 and call it 4D8. That would be an acceptable answer for silver's ions configuration. Another acceptable configuration would be to take away an electron from the 5s2 and call it 5s1 and still just leave this one as 4d9. And then the extra credit configuration, I'm not sure if I can give extra credit on this during distance learning though, because you can probably find this on the internet. But if we were in class where you're using your notes and you're using your periodic, I'm sorry, not using your notes, you're using your periodic table to make this uh, assessment, is that you would say that once it loses the 5s, you know, the 5s2, once one of these electrons is lost right here, then the other one transfers over to the 4d and becomes 4d10. So any one of these answers would get full credit on your test. Now, for my AP chemistry students, we need to have a little explanation for this as to why. So that's where I go to the orbital filling diagram because orbital filling diagrams make so much more sense than electron configurations because we actually see what's going on. Okay, so we have the 5s, we have the 5p, and we have the 4d orbitals in the orbital filling diagram. In the 5s, there are two electrons. This is right now we're talking about neutral silver. We haven't done anything to it yet. In this neutral silver, you're going to put in nine electrons into the 4D, and you're going to put in two electrons in the 5S, and there's exactly what we see over in that uh, electron configuration. Bless you. So then when we go to lose an electron, now I don't want to redraw this over again, so please just be listening and following along so you can see what it is I'm going to do. 
what we're going to do is we're going to take away one of these electrons to turn this into the silver plus one ion, right? I just took one away. So now it looks exactly like what I did in the middle picture is what you see right now, or in the middle electron configuration is what you see right now, okay? But what's special about silver is its location on the periodic table happens to make it where it takes this single electron sitting in the 5s, it removes it from that spot and it places it over here instead so that now it actually looks like this configuration instead. This is something for AP chemistry students, regular honors chemistry students, you're good people. If you can just come up with any one of these three answers that you see right there, you're showing me that the neutral silver lost an electron by taking it away from any one of the spots there, either the 5s2 or the 4d9. And I think the most common answer that I probably will see on the test is that one right there. And you'll get full credit for that. Okay. Gold is going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm not going to waste our time by showing that again. So here you can see that uh, the only difference is I also had to include the Fs because if we're going to get to where gold is at, we have to drop down into the uh, F sublevel. We're not going to go that far down on our periodic table on the test. So therefore, you don't need to worry about that. But anyway, do you notice that the configurations of silver and gold have S2, D9 for both of them? The only difference is, is there's one more energy level for gold than there is for silver. And then when we want it to become a plus one charge, we just remove an electron from somewhere. And you can see that what I chose to do is what was the final answer down here. Uh, but don't worry about that. Do the one that's at the top is just fine. Okay, now let's go to cadmium. Now you'll notice that cadmium is very close to where silver is located. I don't know why our overhead, you guys must be good luck because yesterday you just, every color on the screen looked the same, except for the green looked yellow. You could barely read it. Today, the overhead's showing up very nicely. There's cadmium right there. So cadmium's electron configuration is exactly the same as neutral silver. The only difference is instead of being 4D9, it's 4D10. So we can say that cadmium, before you remove any electrons is, sorry, I was about to put argon, is krypton and then 5s2, 4d10 is the location of cadmium before you turn it into an ion. Now, when you go to turn it into an ion, remove any two electrons that you feel like you want to, except for you can't take them away from the brackets. Those ones are inner energy levels. They have to stay. Would you like to answer one of those, Aidens? Go ahead. 48. Very good. So Aiden is choosing to take away two electrons from the 4D10 and make it 4D8. Somebody else in class might decide to put Krypton, get rid of the, four, the 5S2, and just leave the 4D10. In either case, you've gotten rid of two electrons. You get full credit. Uh, color? Red? So in other words, you're telling me by coming to school, you would like to have your very own red, I keep picking up watermelon, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Your very own red Jolly Rancher, I bet that tastes really good right now. It's about that time of day when a good snack comes along. Question, uh, mercury is the next one. Mercury is the exact same answer as cadmium, only just like we did with gold, it's going to be one more uh, energy level. So the numbers go uh, 5d10 instead of 4d10 and so on and so forth. Okay. And then I threw an extra word up there that we don't need to know in honors chemistry, but in AP chemistry, this word comes up sometimes as they're talking about like an FRQ question is they'll say isoelectronic. Uh, you know, from other classes that the prefix iso means the same and electronic means electronic. In other words, if electrons are the basis of electronics, when we say isoelectronic, we're saying the same electrons. So you'll notice here that once gold loses one electron and mercury loses two electrons, they both have the same electron configurations and therefore we call them isoelectronic. Same thing with silver and cadmium. That will not be on your test but it is something for my AP chemistry students that it's a phrase that's used every once in a while. 
Are there any questions on numbers eight or nine before we move on to number 10? All right, question number 10 says, what does it mean to say that a metal is ductile and to say that a metal is malleable? Um, malleable, but uh, bendable. Good, exactly. Bendable, smashable, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I wanted to let's see if I can open up another tab. Problem is, I don't think I can type using uh, a writing tab. I don't even know if there's going to be anything in the Google search function. Electrons as hinges in metal. Let's see what pops up. Caitlin, did I type something in wrong? Hi. Uh, I don't mind at all as long as you can do it quick. Me? Yeah, I can do it real quick. That's okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, images. So then there's just a bunch of pictures of hinges and a couple pictures of metals, but there's nothing like what I was hoping to see. And now I'm, I wanted us to see if they would actually show like a, a metal, like somebody would make an animation of one and show how when you bend a metal, why doesn't a metal break the same way like if you took a big, I don't know, a salt crystal, right? You could take a hammer to a salt crystal and it's just going to shatter into a, a powder. Whereas if you do the same thing to metal, it's just going to smash it down maybe into a sheet. So what happens is, is the electrons act like hinges. They allow the metal to smash, but still for the pieces to stay together because the electrons are bonding the, the uh, different metal atoms to each other. So that didn't help us, but it was fun. We got to watch them take a picture. Um, that's what malleable means. Ductile means to be able to draw it into a wire. So they're kind of uh, almost synonymous terms, but the reason we're allowed to do this is because like we picked on copper last time, uh, the copper atom, its valence shell of electrons have so few electrons in it that actually two copper atoms can overlap each other just a little bit. And because of that, when the electrons are kind of moving around, the electrons will actually flow from one atom to another atom to another atom, and it kind of just links them. It's like they're linked together, and therefore, as they get moved around, they just they stay as one big piece and we can smash them down into a sheet. We can draw them into a wire. We can bend them. All of those great things. Uh, color, Aiden? Another red going out. Question number 11. Now we're writing electron configurations, this time for chromium. I would prefer to be able to look at a periodic table while I do these. I apologize for not having a periodic table on this slide. Maybe this, nope, this one is permanently on there, but we can do it from this slide. Let me just give myself some more space here. Okay, so in the first one here, we're picking on uh, chromium. I think we're picking on chromium, then manganese, and then iron. Those are three great elements for us to pick on right now. So right now we're doing question number 11. So the CR plus three, the MN plus three, and the FE plus three. And we're looking at these three elements that are all right next to each other on the periodic table. That looks ugly. Let's get rid of those marks there. And maybe right above them, I can write down 3D4, 3D5, and 3D6 as the locations of those uh, battleship positions of those elements. Now what we want to do is we want to lose three electrons. So you know what, let's start by looking at chromium before we lose those electrons. It has a configuration, argon, uh, 4s2, 3d4, manganese, same thing, argon, 4s2, but this time 3d5, and then iron, argon, 4s2, 3d6. So those are our three configurations for our three neutral configurations for those three elements that are next to each other. Now we want to lose three electrons. 
So which three you take away, I don't care. I'm going to give you full credit as long as you take away from this valent shell. So for the chromium, we're going to go with argon. And then maybe you go 4s2, 3d1. I don't want to steal this all away, though, because we're supposed to be having fun right now. Does anybody want to tell me one of those? Well, let's go down here and give us, well, usually what we do in class when there's a full room is we do this by hand, so that at least then I get an opportunity to, to call on somebody different in case somebody different wants it. But nobody else is raising their hand, so Aiden, go ahead. Uh, 3D1. 3D1 because the number up there is just telling us how many electrons are still in the D area. Okay, So it's not like math class where you would say like X to the first power can be written as X. Here we're talking about the number that's up there is telling us how many are in those orbitals. I'm just going to keep writing until somebody wants to go ahead. 3D2. 3D2. Excellent. And so I bet you you'll tell me for the last one, 4S2, 3D3. But here's the funny thing about iron. In a plus 3 charge, what iron's going to do is get rid of two of those electrons and get rid of one of these and only be 3D5. Right? So when you lose the electrons, you lose those two, and you lose one of those. Why is that? For my AP chemistry students, here's the reason why. For my honors chemistry students, you can do whatever you want, as long as you show me losing three. Okay, so if iron, which normally has these electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, what has the greatest stability for iron when it loses three electrons is to get rid of, oh, I just pushed the back arrow, so it did get rid of that electron, and then also gets rid of these two electrons. So there's what the iron's orbital filling diagram looks like for the Fe plus three. By doing that, all of its sublevels are either empty or half full, or then of course the inner energy levels are all full, and that has greater stability. But that's not something that's important for honors chemistry. It's just worth pointing out. And so uh, AP chemistry students just, you know, keep, we'll go over this, of course, again next year. Uh, so you're not, it's not like you have to remember all of this stuff. But it's nice that we can talk about these kinds of things now. And then next year when we bring it up again, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing this before. And it's not a big deal. Uh, color? Blue, my favorite. They changed the formula. They taste so good now. Wouldn't you like to come into school and have your own blue Jolly Rancher for answering the question? You're welcome. Question number 12, use dot diagrams to combine our elements. I'm just going to go to the answer slide on this one so that I don't bore you guys too much. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do on test day. By the way, there is a mistake on that. OK, the, the mistake's not here on this picture. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do on test day, if I'm going to have you actually do the dot diagrams for ionic compounds and then actually send the electrons over. The reason why I don't feel like I want to do this on a test is because today we're going to use the dot diagrams to share electrons, and I don't want to confuse anybody because on AP tests, they never ask us to draw these football plays like this. Right On the AP test, they do ask us to do what we're going to learn today. So I'm not exactly sure how we're going to worry about uh, chemical formulas for the different transition metals. I think we're just going to say we're not going to ask you to do that. We already learned how to write chemical formulas back when we took the Chapter 6-9 test back in the first semester. And so therefore, uh, the reason for us being able to do it, we learned how to crisscross oxidation numbers. We learned how to say Fe plus 3 and O negative 2 versus Fe plus 2 and O negative 2, that when you crisscross those oxidation numbers, you end up with FeO. But we said reduce it down to the simplest whole number ratio. Now you can see why. And then down here, when you crisscross the oxidation numbers, you get Fe2O3, and now you can see why. So we already know how to do this, so therefore we don't necessarily need to be tested on it. Um, so that's that. So I think if I was going to test you on anything, I think that I would like to test you on doing something like, if I can find it, something like this. Plan on being able to do that. 
because this tells me more than me just being a good internet uh, referencer. This shows me that you kind of have an idea of what this class is talking about. You, Google might still tell you these answers. I don't know, because I've never had to Google search these, because to me, it's faster to use a periodic table than to use Google. But um, that's what I want to do as a test for chapter seven uh, ions. For chapter eight, you'll probably also be able to Google search a lot of the chapter eight stuff. So I'm going to probably ask you some concept questions as you go through. And those concept questions will look just like the, the homework assignment tonight. So let's go ahead and get started on our notes here. Uh, you can start copying down examples one and two, leave lots of space because we're gonna be filling in that space with lots of good stuff. My in-class students are going to have the option of doing an extra credit in a few minutes. Uh, I can't offer this lab. I can't force this lab and make it actually worth credit because of the fact that I can't expect you to have access to any of the models that we would make. But that doesn't mean that you don't have access to them. So for example, they make these nice little kits and they sell them on Amazon. Jeff Bezos would love to sell you as many of these kits as you would like to have. And so if you want to uh, get any of the molecular model kits and actually assemble the models that we have for our notes, uh, I can send you out a copy of the chapter 8.1 uh, lab that they're going to get. And if you would like to do something like that, you can. Um, if you don't want to spend money and you're tired of giving billionaires all of our cash, you could almost make them, right? I don't want to just have them made on paper. I'm not going to give you extra credit for that because that just doesn't seem right. If you really are going to do that, come to school. There's plenty of room here. Everybody's wearing their mask. We've got a HEPA filter going in the back of the room. We've got wipings. We've got uh, soap. We've got all of this good stuff so that you're perfectly safe here. Um, so maybe make the decision to come back to school, but otherwise, um, I don't know, you could take tennis balls and pencils and bendable straws. You could make models out of these things. I don't know if it's worth the time, but you know, right now while you're at home, you're bored and lonely anyway, maybe this is something that's a a good idea. Maybe you could do it out of food. What if you could make it out of like, make like little sausage balls and spaghetti noodles. And then after you've made the models, then you could feed it to your family. So like get a two for one, right? I don't know, something out there, but you should anything you want to do for extra credit, you should always run it by me first, because number one, I have to assess whether or not what you're doing is safe. And number two, I have to tell you whether or not you're going to get any extra credit for it, because some things I'm like, nah, I'm going to give an extra credit for that. All right. So what we learned, let's keep our eye on the prize here. What we learned in chapter seven is that there are elements who will actually give up their electrons and form positive ions. There are elements that will actually take electrons and form negative ions. And then they bond to each other because they're like little magnets. They stick to each other. Don't draw this right now. We'll put it in red. Red is our universal color of you don't necessarily need to copy this down. When sodium loses an electron and chlorine gains an electron, they do not share any electrons. They bond to each other because positives and negatives are attracted to each other. They're bonded to each other like magnets. That was the purpose of chapter seven. 
In chapter eight, we're now dealing with elements that don't have the ability to completely give and take their electron. What we're gonna see is a lot of times these atoms are close to each other on the periodic table. They never involve elements from column one. They rarely involve elements from column two. Those elements never get involved in covalent bonds. What we see is a lot of times the covalent bonds, if you don't mind me going back to another periodic table one more time, what we see is that most of our covalent bonds come, no, no, I circled too far. Most of our covalent bonds come from, come on, Penn, this isn't the time for us to stop working. Most of our covalent bonds come from elements that are right inside this block right here. In fact, even that, we don't even use all of those. We probably would even cut this off, you know, somewhere. You might look at those elements. So let's erase this. So if you guys needed to decide whether a bond was ionic or covalent, inside that little Tetris shape is where most of your covalent bonds come from. These are elements that don't have the ability to completely steal away electrons from other elements that are similar to them. Right, even if chlorine and fluorine are very, very electronegative and like to steal away electrons, elements like carbon and nitrogen are strong enough that they don't completely give them up. There is one element here I'm missing. We should also include hydrogen over in this group as well. Notice I didn't circle the noble gases because they are not involved in bonding, so therefore we just leave them out of this. There are situations where they do form covalent bonds, but not in this class, so we don't need to worry about that. Even in AP chemistry, we really don't talk much about them. But every once in a while, like xenon and fluorine will form a covalent bond. Not important. All right, good times. So, hydrogen. What about that hydrogen? Well, you know, the thing is about hydrogen is if hydrogen wants to satisfy its octet rule, that it's not going to work right there. One electron, in fact, hydrogen never satisfies an octet rule. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Hydrogen really satisfies a duet rule. It only wants two electrons. So where is hydrogen going to get its other electron? The most common thing that hydrogen does is it finds another element that also needs one more electron and they share. They share a pair of electrons. So we're going to call that a shared pair of electrons. In this case, the hydrogen is going to share an electron with another hydrogen. So let's draw two of them. Now remember, don't copy down anything you see in red. That electron right there has to be shared with the other hydrogen that's there. But it's too difficult for me to show that they're being shared between each other if I draw it way over on the other side. So just like I taught you with making dot diagrams, you can put the dots anywhere you want to around an atom. And so instead of me putting the dot on the right hand side of this second hydrogen, I'm going to put the dot on the left. Oh, 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 that was supposed to be green. I'm going to put the dot on the left hand side of the hydrogen. Okay. Now, those two electrons that are there, they're going to, and I, what I do is I draw a little lasso around the two. That little lasso kind of shows that we're grouping them together and pulling those two atoms in close to each other, such that what the picture now will look like. Okay, let's get rid of that sodium and chloride. They don't belong in this chapter. So now what we have is the hydrogen and the other hydrogen are sharing a pair of electrons in between them. That right there is called a shared pair of electrons. We're gonna be putting that in our notes in just a moment. It shows up on the next slide. That shared pair of electrons, to draw this faster, a lot of times is drawn with an, just a single line like so to represent the shared pair of electrons. You're gonna be adding stuff into the notes here in just a moment right below this. So let's make sure that your fluorine is down low enough so that it's not in the way because we're going to point arrows at both of these models that of the things that I'm saying to you right now. Okay, let's do the same thing with fluorine. Fluorine is found in column 17. So when you draw your fluorine, we're going to put seven dots around it. Remember, column 17 ends in a seven. So that means seven valence electrons. And we have two of them. So when you go and draw your second fluorine, remember, don't copy what you see in red. If you draw your second fluorine in exactly the same fashion as you draw the first one, yes. Anything in column 17, seven dots. Okay. 
So now I'm not going to draw it exactly the same way because if I want a lasso, it's difficult for me to draw a lasso that looks like that. That looks funny. It still works. I mean, as your teacher, if you do that on your test, I'm not going to mark that wrong. But here's a better idea is if you can put the electrons anywhere you want to, why not instead of putting your seven where they look exactly the same, let's put our two single electrons on the same side of each other. So that way, when you go to do your lasso, you can just circle them like so. And now those two fluorines are doing exactly the same thing that the hydrogen is doing up here. They're sharing one pair of electrons, and then they each still have some unshared pairs that don't get involved in the bonds. Now, if you do some counting right now, count this fluorine. Let's, don't put this on yours. Once again, this is red. Don't put red. We'll call this one F1. We'll call this one F2. Let's look at F1 right now. Count the number of electrons surrounding it. There's eight. Now let's look at F2. Count the number of electrons around it. There's eight. Some of you might be thinking, but Mr. Purser, you just counted those middle pair twice. That's the thing about chemistry is we're allowed to count the middle pair twice. Each of these two fluorines believes it owns those two electrons, right? It's just like I own a drill, right? And the other day, my wife lent my drill to a friend of hers because she wanted to hang a bird feeder up because all the birds are going crazy right now. I didn't know. So I own a drill, but I didn't know that the drill was being borrowed by somebody else until I went to go use the drill and I took it out of the drawer and my wife said, oh, I see that Samantha brought the drill back, right? So I own a drill, yet I share it with somebody else and we both think we own a drill because we both use the same drill. It's just we don't both need to have them all the time. So two electrons can be shared by two different elements and both of the elements think that they own those two electrons. And so both of these satisfy the octet rule. That's a good time. That was a good story, huh? All right, there's a whole lot of words for you. Remember, you don't have to copy down the stuff in red. I just wanted you guys to notice some things about boiling temperatures that we'll talk about as we get to the end of these notes today. And we're just going to watch the boiling temperatures go from 20 to 80 to 180 to 373. Everybody's heard of that number before. We'll see what that means in a little bit. But the stuff that's in blue and purple and all of that, you probably want to copy down. On your test, I will be asking you things like, draw the fluorine molecule. You'll draw this picture right here. And here's the thing. You don't even need to use Google because by the time we're done with this chapter, we will have done every single molecule that would be given on an honors chemistry test. So all of the answers will already be in your notes. It's just that there will be some sub-questions that go with it. Like for example, draw the molecule for fluorine. Then I'm gonna ask you, how many shared pairs of electrons are there? And you're gonna say, there is one shared pair of electrons. How many unshared pairs of electrons are there? And you're gonna say, there are a total of six unshared pairs of electrons. Or you could tell me there's three per fluorine and I would give you full credit for that. Okay. Then I'm gonna ask you, is this molecule polar or nonpolar? And you're going to tell me in this case that it's nonpolar. You might know the word polarity because polarity is something that makes us kind of think of batteries and magnets and things like that. What polarity is, is when a molecule acts like a little magnet. As a whole, the molecule acts like a magnet. And how we know when a molecule is polar is when the two elements that are bonded to each other are not the same. Not the same element. So a fluorine with a fluorine is nonpolar because they share that pair of electrons equally between each other. And so there's no positive or negative side to this molecule. It's nonpolar. What does that matter? Nonpolarity means that things tend to have really low boiling points. Their boiling temperatures are really low. I mean, look at how low these are. Negative 181 degrees Celsius. How would you ever have fluorine as a liquid? I'd like to go on to the next slide, but if anybody throws into the chat, no, then I'll know that you still are copying the slide down and that I should slow down. Okay, thank you, that's all I needed to hear.
I'm glad you asked that question. We might need to go a couple slides down here to see that there can be double and triple bonds as well. So yes. How about now? Can I go forward? Thank you. For those of you at home typing into the chat, you can abbreviate things. If you don't want me to move forward, if I say, can I move forward and just put an N into the chat or a W into the chat, that will tell me that you're saying no or wait. That way you don't have to take the time to write. And if, if you are done and you're ready, you can always put a Y and that'll tell me that you're okay or okay, right? Just like texting, you can put a K. Hydrogen chloride. Okay, so same thing applies here. We're going to start by drawing our two elements. There's hydrogen with its one dot. Column one, one dot. Chlorine with its seven dots. Once again, when you go to put your seven dots, why would you put the single dot on the right-hand side and put the double dots on the left-hand side if we're about to lasso them together? Why don't we instead put the single dot on the left-hand side and put the double dots on the right-hand side? Now the two places where we're missing an electron are facing each other and we can circle them. Mr. Purser, we can do that? Yes. I've told you since we did our first dot diagrams back in chapter five that you can put, or maybe it's chapter six, you can put the dots anywhere you want to. It's just by convention, north, south, east, and west is where we normally place them. But where you put the singleton, that's up to you. So once I circle those together, now what I can say about this is hydrogen chloride has a single bond in between there. So there's one shared pair. Then hydrogen doesn't need any more unshared pairs because it only needs two electrons. And so by sharing with chlorine, it thinks it has two electrons. And then the chlorine still has the other six, three unshared pairs. But something special happens here. Chlorine is very electronegative where hydrogen is not so electronegative. It's strong enough that it can still share with chlorine, but it's not as strong as chlorine in holding on to electrons. So what happens is, and I don't think you need to draw this, so I'm gonna put it in red, is this pair of electrons actually spends more time over with the chlorine than it does with the hydrogen. It's kind of like that drill. Samantha thinks she owns a drill because she has it at her house one day a month. Whereas the drills at my house, 29 days out of 30, right? So we both think we have the drill, even though I have the drill more often because maybe I'm the chlorine, I'm more electronegative, right? But we're still sharing them. So therefore, both of us feel like we have a drill. Both of these two elements feel like they have that pair of electrons, all right? Now, why does that matter? Because this then creates polarity. It makes this side of the chlorine slightly negative and it makes this side with the hydrogen slightly positive. Now, how chemists note something that is slightly positive and slightly negative is instead of putting the sign, they put the Greek letter delta, the lowercase one that looks like a music note. So you would say delta positive and delta negative on either side of that. Let's see what we have on this slide. There it is down here at the bottom, okay? That's called a polar bond. So what's special about a polar bond? Look at how much higher the, the boiling point is. It's 100 Kelvin higher than it was for the fluorine. Down at the bottom there, it says some pretty important words. All bonds, all, not some, not most, all bonds between two different atoms are polar. Anytime that you have two different atoms, it's polar. Now, some of them are very close to being nonpolar because of the fact that their electronegativity numbers are very close to the same. But even if they round to the same value, because I think like gallium and germanium have the same electronegativity values. It doesn't matter. In real life, if you go past two places past the decimal, they're not the exact same electronegativities. 
And therefore, one of them is going to have the electrons more time than the other. So all bonds between two different elements are polar. But we're going to see in tomorrow's notes that not every single polar bond creates a polar molecule. But let's save that thought for next time we're together. Can I go forward? Anybody at home want me to wait? All right, nobody's complaining. I'm going. Oh, 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 there was one. How about now? Not yet. How about now? All right, no complaints, I'm going forward. Water, I think we have two slides here, this slide and one more and we're all done. We already know what water looks like. Everybody in here knows that water looks like a Mickey's Mouse head. But when you make the model of this, uh, either today or next time we meet for my in-class people, what you're going to see for the, wa the water molecule is that it's going to just look all the same size because this is public education and we can't afford to give you different size spheres based on all the different size elements, right? But the fact that hydrogen is so much smaller than oxygen actually makes this picture that you're seeing right now look like a Mickey Mouse head. So now what our job to do is to explain why it looks like that in real life, which is called three-dimensional life, as opposed to the fake life of on a piece of paper. So let's start by drawing it. So you have a hydrogen. And by the way, you need to also know who's the central atom, which atom gets to be in the middle. Now, rule number one is hydrogen can never be attached to more than one element because if it only needs two electrons, there's no reason for it to attach to another atom, okay? So oxygen is gonna be our central atom. And so therefore, when we put our six dots, we would probably start by putting our, here's four of the six dots like this. Now, where do you put your next two dots is entirely up to you. Some of you may decide to put one of the dots here and one of the dots there. If you do that, then you should probably put your other hydrogen right there. Somebody else in this class who thinks a little bit differently might draw their picture, you don't need to draw this twice, might draw their picture looking like this. And then if you do that, you're gonna to wanna to put your other hydrogen down here. Either way, both answers are correct and both answers are wrong. When you lasso, you lasso these two together, you lasso these two together, and so your top picture shows a picture that looks like a nice symmetric, like a TIE fighter or something. And then your bottom picture, when you lasso these electrons, if you chose to draw this one, this picture for you looks like it's a bend to it, or it looks like a, a right angle, right? So which one of those answers is correct? Neither of them is correct. Both of them are correct. Because the problem is, is what you're looking at on the paper right now is a two-dimensional drawing. And one thing that I haven't said to you yet today, nobody's asked me in here or in the chat, is do you have a spelling problem, Mr. Purser? Because at the very beginning of the note, somewhere on here, you wrote the word V-S-E-P-R, and that's there's no word like that in the English language, except for that if you type that into Google, Google will immediately know what you're talking about because everybody who knows chemistry learns about Vesper theory. That's an acronym that stands for valence shell, right? So valence shell is our dot diagram electrons. Valence shell electron pair, so pairs of electrons, repulsion theory. In other words, electrons repel each other in pairs. They repel the other pairs of electrons, okay? So when we get to this picture for water right now, 
we need to explain what the shape is. How can the electrons reach maximum separation from each other? Because if you're pretty good at geometry, what you would say is these electrons right here are 90 degrees apart from each other. That these electrons right here are 90 degrees apart from each other. That would be the maximum separation in a two-dimensional world. If you go to a three-dimensional world, watch what happens. That angle right there is not 90 degrees, is it? It's greater than 90 degrees. In three dimensions, these actually form a three-dimensional shape called a tetrahedron, but we don't learn about that till next time we take notes. But this is based on the tetrahedron. And so your two unshared pairs, those are the single dots on the oxygen, that's represented by these orange lines, these orange sticks. And then the shared pairs are represented by the regular wooden colored sticks. And here's your two hydrogens and here's your oxygen. And we seek maximum separation in Vesper theory by going into this shape right here that we call bent or Mickey Mouse head. Of course, on a test, you would never call it Mickey Mouse head. I won't give you credit for that. All right, so that's water. And then another thing we can say about water is water is polar. You know water's polar. We should do a demonstration that shows that water's polar. We'll save that for next time we uh, are together. Uh, here's a nice picture talking all about that good stuff. We got one more slide. We're almost there. Have you been following our story today? Did you notice that we went from 20 Kelvin to 80 Kelvin to 180 Kelvin, and now we're at 373 Kelvin? You see that our boiling temperature is going up? Why? Well, number one is nonpolar molecules have very low boiling temperatures because they have trouble sticking to each other. You're like, what are you talking about sticking to each other? Don't copy this down. Earlier, we talked about fluorine. When we say that fluorine boils at a low temperature, we're saying that two fluorines separate from each other very easily. And when things separate from each other, that's a gas. Okay? Water molecules are very attracted to each other. They attract to each other by a special kind of polarity called hydrogen bonding. This hydrogen right here, this Mickey Mouse ear, actually sticks to the chin of another Mickey Mouse head really well. And so therefore you have to raise the temperature of liquid water up to 100 degrees Celsius, or in other words, 373 Kelvin in order to get it to boil. Because that's how it, what it takes to break that bond apart. Okay. I think all of this should make sense. And then learning these pictures is just something new. By the way, because of the Mickey Mouse head having two different elements in it, um, oxygen is very electronegative. This pair of electrons that's right here spends more time down next to the oxygen. This pair of electrons right here also spends more time down near the oxygen. Plus the oxygen also has two unshared pairs of its own anyway. Those eight electrons spend most of their time with the oxygen, barely any time with the two hydrogens. Poor hydrogens, but don't worry. They only need the drill once a month, right? So they still think that they have those pair of electrons. So it's not a big deal. They're being shared. They're just not shared equally. But because of that, that causes the oxygen chin to be very, very negative. And the oxygen ears, I'm sorry, the water molecule ears, the hydrogens, to be very, very positive. And that's a polarity. And that actually creates a special kind of bond called a hydrogen bond, which is why how we explain why water has such a high boiling point. As you've been warned here in red, you will be drawing this picture on your test. And I will ask you some questions based on the things I just have said to you in the notes. I hope you were listening. Can I go to the last slide or the last set of slides, the last two examples? No complaints and go. Aiden was just asking us in class, are there times where you can share more than one pair of electrons? Yes, there are. Oxygen and nitrogen will demonstrate that for us. You can see your homework assignment. I'll show you what it looks like in just a moment once we finish these two problems. Oxygen, six dots. Where do you put those six dots? Completely up to you. But I will tell you this much. Don't put the six dots where you have the two single tins on either side of the oxygen. 
It would be better for you to put this two, this two singletons, something like that. Here's why. When you go to draw your other oxygen, do the same thing in reverse. That way, when you go to do your lassos, it's a lot easier just to go, let's lasso these two together and let's lasso these two together. But if you do your homework in pen, uh, pen and you've already drawn it one way, you can make these lassos circle anywhere. I've, I've taught chemistry for a while. I'll figure it out. I'll understand what it is that you're trying to do. So you don't have to redraw it necessarily. So now when we draw the oxygens, we actually have four dots that are in the middle of the two oxygens. So that's two shared pairs. Now, Vesper theory says that the unshared pairs, you'll get full credit if you draw the unshared pairs like this. That's full credit. But the truth is, those two unshared pairs will actually seek maximum separation from the other electron clouds by actually going onto the diagonals like that. And they'll do that on both sides. So since you're able to use your notes on your test, we might as well draw it the correct way and then you can copy it the correct way. If you wanna draw this with lines, instead of using the dots, what you would do is you would draw two lines to represent two shared pairs. Would we consider the oxygen molecule to be polar or nonpolar? Are they two different elements? No, therefore this would be a nonpolar bond. So we should expect oxygen to have a low boiling point. We'll see that on the next slide, but let's do nitrogen before we do that. Okay, so nitrogen. Nitrogen has five dots that you're gonna put around it. So where do you put your five dots? One, two, three, there's four of the dots. Here's the other nitrogen. One, two, three, there's four of the dots. If you're putting them side by side to each other, wouldn't it make sense to put the unshared pair on the back side of both of the two nitrogens so that all of the single electrons kind of line up around each other? There's one shared pair. There's a second shared pair. And there's a third shared pair. That's called a triple bond. Is a triple bond stronger than a double bond, stronger than a single bond? Not necessarily. Bond strength is not determined by the number of pairs of electrons that are in it. It's more determined by the atoms themselves. But that is a pretty stable molecule. Did you know that when they were theorizing making the first nuclear weapons, that there was a theory that said that if they ignite the first nuclear explosion, that it could set off a chain reaction that causes all of the nitrogen in the air to react with the oxygen in the air. And we would no longer have any air to breathe. Remember we breathe, nitrogen is, is basically inert. It doesn't affect us when we breathe it in. So it's in our lungs, we breathe it out. Oxygen, of course, we need that for respiration. There was a theory out there that said it could have caused the end of the atmosphere when they do the first nuclear uh, reaction. And then they did it anyway, right? So when we think about how great America is, just remember that we're no better than anybody else, that our people in charge are willing to take chances that could affect all the rest of us, just like everybody else. So what can I say? Vote. Look at those boiling points. Back down under uh, 100 Kelvin. Both of them are nonpolar. I put this in, in red. That really should have been in another color because I think you should include that in your notes. Thank you for your attention. Chapter eight, homework number one is your homework assignment. I'm gonna flash just to show you what it looks like and then I'll come back to this slide for those of you who are still copying. Each of the problems is basically the same thing. Draw the structure, how many shared pairs, how many unshared pairs, do you think it's polar or nonpolar? Your test is going to look exactly like these questions when we do the chapter eight part of this. So please do your homework. All right, thank you. You can start checking out now if you're at home and we'll see you on Friday. Uh, nothing due tomorrow because you guys don't have any at-home labs for this chapter. So you have just a homework assignment due on Friday.
coming out. Bye, everybody.